Welcome to What If So What, the podcast where we ask what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real in your business. I'm Jim Hertzfeld. And I'm Kim Chopek. We're part of Proficient's digital strategy team. And today we'll ask what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? As someone who grew up in and around Detroit, Michigan, and who worked in and consulted to the automotive industry, it's almost impossible not to become a so-called car guy. I still get excited driving past the River Roof steel mill or checking out the latest vehicles in the lobby of the Rensen in downtown Detroit. And my personal favorite, spotting a test vehicle out in the wild, wrapped in camouflage and filled with engineers making final adjustments before launching. If you know, you know. It's why it's still called the Motor City. But the current reality is that today, there's more than one Motor City. Marysville, Ohio, Herndon, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, Plano, Texas, Austin, Texas, and Shanghai, China. The automotive industry is in constant transition, becoming more complex through globalization and digital transformation. But one constant remains, the feeling, the emotion that a scenic drive in a cool car gives us. We have a great guest this episode who is going to give us some insight on how one of the biggest and most iconic brands in the world continues to tap into emotion, but in ways you might not expect. With us today is Will Stacy, Chief Marketing and Digital Officer at GM Financial. Will, I'm so glad we could finally put this together. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jim. So glad to be here. So, Will, a lot of people know about uh, GM. They may not know as much about GM Financial. And, and in fact, I think as a, as a brand name, it's relatively new considering the sort of long GM heritage. Before we dive in, you want to tell us a little bit more about GM Financial and what your role is? Yeah, GM Financial is the captive global lender for General Motors. So today in the States, we, we operate at about 40, 45% of all GM sales we finance. Globally, we have another 3 million customers. We have 3 million here in the States and 3 million globally in, in countries like China and Mexico, uh, Brazil, um, throughout different countries in South America and Canada. You know, just glad to be a part of the GM organization. We've, uh, GM purchased a company in Fort Worth called AmeriCredit about, uh, I guess it's now 11 years ago. And uh, we, you know, we've set up and built a global captive from the AmeriCredit brand now to a, a global GM financial finance brand for consumers and dealers around the world. It's the other fuel for the industry aside from the, the gas, right? We gotta, we drive that dealer experience, the buying experience. You know, sometimes I, I've, I've thought of you guys in captive finances. So the only link between the, the driver, the owner uh, and the brand, which I thought was really an interesting part of, of your role. It's interesting because there's 4,200 independent dealers here in the United States that have a GM dealership, and they essentially operate for us as franchisees or dealers that mm-hmm. you know sell uh, the vehicles we we manufacture, but they also act as the first line of finance options for our customers. So the, the dealer experience is just as important to us as the customer experience, and and we try to do as much as we can to make that customer experience inside a dealership better. Right, lots of opportunity there. And it seems like it's certainly every industry is in some state of revolution. It always feels that way to me. To me. Yeah, <laughs> Automotive, yeah. I think, has been particularly wild lately you know, with electrification, with uh, autonomous vehicles, certainly ride sharing over the last decade or so, and sort of this big shift towards mobility. And I think automotive is one of those industries or, or categories that, at least in the U.S., has always sort of captivated the emotion right, of the consumer. So how is how does GMF and GM changing with those shifts? You know whether it's coming from new new tech or becoming a better digital business or just kind of keeping up with how the rest of the the automotive or mobility industry is changing. First, you know, COVID and the supply chain issues have really done a number to the automotive industry. As COVID started to happen, everyone stopped manufacturing with fears that that we would have all this inventory built up. And so mm-hmm. many of the manufacturers, including General Motors, you know, stopped production, safety reasons, you know, supply reasons, et cetera, demand reasons. But not long after the American shutdown in March, the demand really rebound very quickly and the demand for new cars exploded. The demand for cars exploded in general and the supply wasn't there for these consumers, especially here in the U.S. And so you know, we used to have a, what we call day supply, the number of cars on dealership lots waiting to be sold. That day supply would average somewhere between 60, 70, even 180 days, a car would sit there before it's sold. 
Now, in some cases, you have negative day supply or, or one oh. to two to three <laughs> days supply. And so the, the way people buy cars now is just different because there's not a lot of cars on the lot, which created a, an influx of this weird economic cycle of used car values spiking right. because used cars were, were available ASAP. New cars, oftentimes you had to order. So the industry the last 18, 24 months has been in this weird cycle of, you know, high demand, low supply, high prices. Dealerships have been able to take advantage of that and and meet the demand you know, where they can with new and used vehicles. And we've been able to partner with them to help with this weird economic cycle. I mean, we used to have 60,000 cars a month coming off lease that we would then sell in inventory, you know, in, in auctions to, to our dealers. Now there's no cars coming off off lease because all those cars are being purchased by the dealer where the lease is turned in. Mm -hmm. So that side of our business is really is really different. And so the market has definitely changed the last two years. As it relates to technology, I mean, you know, at first customers wanted to shop digitally. They wanted to experience a different way of of buying a car just because they didn't want to come into a dealership because of the safety factors. That has somewhat died off. I mean, customers still like to be able to test drive and, and touch and feel a vehicle. However, there still is customers, there still are customers that want to just buy it online. And especially with inventory challenges, you know, a lot of times you're buying a car out of state and having it shipped because the car you want isn't available at your local dealer. So the digital experience, you know, the shopping experience has changed. Uh, the finance experience is changing where customers want to handle that whole experience online. They don't want to go into, you know, a finance office sometimes because they, they're doing it remote or they don't want to come into the dealership. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've created a lot of new tools during COVID for digital applications, for our dealers, what we call e-contractor, e-funding, where, you know, there's no paper involved with the, with the contract. You know, we have 3 million customers here in the U.S. And so we had a real spike in just questions about their vehicle, questions about their lease, can they extend their lease? And so we really had to ramp up our technology and, and around service mm -hmm. to service our customers to get their questions answered. Yeah, well, we, we've been sort of joking about this for a couple of years. If you did a quiz about who drove your digital transformation, was it the CMO <laughs> or the CIO? And the answer is COVID. Yeah, COVID so, for sure. Yeah, we're still talking about it. But um, we're seeing this across categories, self-service. I think what I'm kind of picking up here and what's interesting about your perspective is you're data driven, you're KPI driven. It's part of your makeup. Well, it's part of your job, but you know, that data has to come from somewhere. And we, we love to talk about being data driven and then learning from that data, understanding consumer demands and behaviors, changes, predicting those. A lot of that comes from business intelligence and, and measurement, but you know, some industries are a little further ahead. Uh, some are not as you deploy these technologies to sort of facilitate this customer experience, you're also given a lot more input and feedback and data to help you learn. Is that an accurate statement uh, for, as, as you've gone through this transition? Are you using that data as a learning process, as a learning ground as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have more data now that we know what to do with when it comes to our customer feedback. So we have Medallia surveys, we have iOS and Android surveys, we have reviews, we have complaints. There is a lot of data we have uh, from consumers about what they want. Luckily, we have a great team of you know, data scientists, analytic professionals who use tools like Medallia and Clara Bridge and others and IBM Watson to help us, you know, make some sense of this. And, you know, the, the data tells us most times what features people are wanting, what kinds of capabilities people want when it comes to buying, leasing, or releasing a car. In fact, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to share with you was, was since COVID has happened, you know, GM and, and all manufacturers are very into and spend a lot of money on auto shows. So auto shows are a big way for consumers to learn more about vehicles and, and see the newest tech, et cetera, especially if you don't want to go to a dealership and, and buy something you just want to learn. And so when COVID happened, the, the auto show circuit, the whole experience kind of went away. And so what General Motors has done, and we've, we've helped uh, where we can at GM Financial as well, is you know, we've set up a, a massive studio in Detroit that actually was a, was a former Target. And we took that Target store that we, we leased and built a massive auto show, a virtual auto show. And so today, you, know, you can go on to Chevy.com and click 
click on the Chevy My Way experience and you can go through any of our vehicles with a you know product specialist with a gimbal and an iPhone and walk through any features you want on that vehicle. Uh, and they can answer any questions. Is, you know, and we're adding, you know, at quite a sh- questions that customers have around financing as well. And, you know, that's one of those examples where customers wanted to see cars, wanted to experience the car, but they didn't want to go into a dealership, but they didn't want to go to a car show. And now we've got this, I mean, again, massive studio that has different sections for each of our brands, a section for electric vehicles, a section for, you know, partners like GM Financial and OnStar. The Chevy portion is on board that each brand is coming online as, as this year progresses, but really exciting technology and tools that, to your point, based on data and requests of like, you know, sometimes it's one-on-one, sometimes it's a 20 people want to get the same tour of a vehicle. You can schedule a tour with other people. Hmm. I got to check this out. Well, yeah. I gotta, you gotta, I'm, I'm up in Detroit, so you're going to have to give me the address for this place. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a top <laughs> secret address, but, yeah. but you and me will go tour it. It's, I, I toured it uh, last month. Yeah, and I'd it love was to see it. Spectacular. Yeah. Now I'm going to call that virtual reality reality. I don't know if that's going <laughs> to, you, you, can, you can coin that phrase. But to your question, I mean, whether it's, you know, I want to see a vehicle or, hey, I, I want to buy another vehicle or lease another vehicle, but the vehicle that I want is not in stock. I need to extend my lease six yeah. months. Yeah. And so, you know, so much data we're getting from consumers and all the channels they can chat with us on, which has really helped us, you know, build tools, build technology, build features, you know, all of our customer facing technologies like chat, like messaging, like our mm-hmm. mobile apps, our websites, you know, many of which Proficient helps us power. And, you know, we've seen a a tremendous amount of success on the NPS side, customer satisfaction side, first call resolution, you know, handling Mm -hmm, of those mm -hmm, of those problems, mm -hmm. all of that based on feedback we get from customers. That's really cool. And um, I just love that it's that there's so many options out there and you guys are really being data driven and as a consumer giving giving us what we want. How do you see that kind of feedback affecting the way you lead teams, you lead organizations. I think there's a lot of inertia in a lot of organizations, as we all know. I mean, I think a lot of organizations, you know, especially the older organizations, you know, people think of, maybe they think of GM as just recently celebrated its 100th anniversary, but you guys have really shifted. How has all this sort of changed the way that leaders manage the teams to, to affect these changes? Yeah. I mean, part of the challenge when it comes to all this data and feedback is deciding what to do next. You know, we have so much We have a backlog of two or three years. And, you know, the reality is, is that a three-year backlog is almost pointless because in three years, I mean, it's going to be different, right? And so it's put a lot of pressure on, on leaders and and our team members, as well as our employees closest to the, to the customer to figure out, okay, we have a limited amount of resources we can apply to things that customers want, features, technology, new tech. And how do we apply that in the way that puts the customer at the center of everything we do? And it's challenging. It's a, it's a struggle as leadership and as, as team members uh, on our team of figuring out what to do next. You know, sometimes the squeakiest wheel gets the, gets the mm-hmm. fixes first. Um, sometimes, you know, there's features that I want that I've been asking for, for years that I can't get in <laughs> because they're, they're nice to haves, but I think they're really yeah. important, right? But, but customers don't ask for them. And so it's, it's always a balance of yeah. how do we prioritize what we think our customers want and need you know, alongside driving revenue, increasing NPS, lowering call volume, lowering costs. And so while we have so much data and science in our hands, at the end, it does come down to an art to how do you decide what to do with all this. And, you know, while there's data, there is a lot of gut decisions happening saying, I think this is our best direction. You know, as as people say, it's, it's an art and a science at some level to figure out what to do next. Well, you mentioned the sort of the art form and, and, and the judgment. And I think a lot of that comes from experience. A lot of that comes from training, education, but a lot of it, I think, comes from mentorship. I think it's, you know, it, it comes from helping others close to you, maybe who have been there or can give you a different perspective. You know, I know you're a big believer in, in mentorship over the years. How, how, did, how has that affected this approach and how has it affected, you know, your career and the, the careers of, of those around you? Mentorship to me is a very important factor in my career growth personally. You know, I have, I have almost a, a panel of mentors. I have real estate mentors and finance mentors and, you know, career mentors. I have people that help me mentor me on how to 
you know, raise my, my children and, and be a good father, you know, spiritual mentors help me to, you know, pursue my faith. And so it's been a journey for me over, you know, over my lifetime of a series of really powerful mentors. And you mentioned the instinct. And I want to, I want to dig in on that just for a second. So one of my mentors, one of my, my business mentors, we, we talk a lot about instinct and gut feel. And as someone who's very high in the empathy scale, you know, most marketing leaders have a good background in empathy and have a good muscle for that. And, you know, I have a strong empathy feel, I'm pretty emotionally intelligent when it comes to that. And th- there were so many times in my career, I would, I would feel in my gut what the right decision was to do or the right direction, the right path to go with a, a project or a person or whatever else. But there's so many times I would kind of just bury that. And I, I would just, you know, I'd either stay quiet or I wouldn't mention it or I, I would just ignore it. And through, through a lot of feedback from my mentor and, and a lot of just journaling, you know, I would say, okay, here's what I want to do. I'm not going to mention it, but I'm going to come back and revisit this. And, you know, more often than not, when I would, you know, write things down or mention things to a colleague that here's what I would do in the situation, but not mention it, you know, it, it would turn out that that would have been the best thing to do. And so, you know, he encouraged me to toy with that, to dip my toe in that water a little bit and to get better at, you know, listening to my gut, which at first was a little scary because you just feel like, well, I don't want to take this big of a risk. But the more you start to do it as a leader and, and you know, with some experience under your belt, you learn that it is a powerful tool for success. And, you know, now I'm to the point where I, I listen to my gut a lot more than I used to. And I still temper it with other people and getting feedback, et cetera. But, you know, there are things that come up in the moment or there are things that I, I, I look at and, and make decisions on that are gut decisions that I'm much more confident in my, in my gut feel and my intuition than I, than I was five years ago. And it was a process of, of trusting that intuition and trusting the experience you have, you know, kind of going with what you feel sometimes. You know, it can be risky, but, you know, once you've had some success with going with your gut, it, you, st- you start to really rely on it as an advantage. I guess I feel the same way, Will. I've, I've uh, fortunately been you know, in the business long enough, and I, I, I'm glad you mentioned journaling. I started journaling about 20 years ago, and um, but I haven't applied your technique where you're sort of creating a data point and then revisiting that, but that's a great direction. To your question on mentorship, I mean, I, it's, it's become a a way of life for me in my career. I had in college a few mentors that were very influential to me when it came to my finances and my career, Uh, men and women who were just very, very knowledgeable and very generous with their time and made a huge impact on me as a, as a 20 year old, you know, in college. Some of them gave me access to things I never would have access to, you know, leadership, uh, observing, shadowing people to see what they do in different situations. Uh, you know, so much of leadership is, is caught by modeling. And so, you know, being able to observe leaders in their environment as a young professional, you know, in marketing and advertising and, and digital was so beneficial for me because I, I learned by observing and by osmosis some, from some really good and, and sometimes not good leaders but that really impacted the way that, you know, I lead now. And so I've read a fair amount of books on the, on the topic and, you know, there's lots of ways to approach mentorship, but I, I, I try to uh, really encourage, you know, my team to both be mentors and, you know, be a, be a good mentee. You know, being a good mentee doesn't mean it's a lifetime commitment or a mentor. Does, you know, I, I try to make it very clear in my first meetings with, with mentees or mentors here are the things I need your help on. Here's the commitment I want to I want to make in terms of a timeline. If I'm a mentee, here are the things I'm going to do to give some direction to our time together. And you know, and if if it goes awry or it isn't what one of us expected, we have the freedom to speak up and and talk about it. And so, you know, that's done me well in my time as a as a mentor and mentee. And for me personally too, it you know, we, we started a mentor program with our. A chief diversity officer, Shonda Robinson, about seven years ago. And I was, you know, one of the founding partners of that to really help get it off the ground. And, you know, I think to date I've mentored 14 executives at, at GM Financial. And, you know, it's, some are, some are really into it, some aren't, which is fine. 
But the ones that are into it, I mean, it, it really, I learned so much from them and gained so much insight into things that are going on in the company, you know, how to help folks in their career to, to the point where I built a small curriculum because I wanted to have something that was repeatable and, and measurable for these uh, mentees throughout, you know, our time together. And it's, it's really a, it's really a joy. I, I've had the, ex, I've had the good fortune to mentor a lot of professionals of color and women. And I've kind of told our team that that's what I want to mentor exclusively because I just feel like I want to be able to give professionals of color women access to things that sometimes they don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've been really blessed with, with unique access in my career. And I want to be able to share that and give them insight to, you know, how they can succeed. And, and what it's done for me is, I mean, it's given me a lens on some of the challenges that you know, professionals of color women have in our industry and in their careers that have really opened my eyes and are, are helped me push change in our organization to make it better. That's great. I love that sort of level of consciousness, right? I feel, I feel like you're, you're, you're building within yourself and others. And there's, there's purpose to that. I think we're all looking for, for purpose. It's interesting that you found a purpose in that purposeful approach as well. Uh, that, that's great to hear. And I love, you've, you've inspired me to think about mentorship a little differently. I never really thought about the uh, sort of having a, a structure. It always felt like mentorship was sort of like a, a special form of just networking. You know, like I feel like I, well, I just have to get to know people, you know, and then, and then if I'm lucky, a mentorship will sort of organically occur, but there's a purpose behind it. And uh, I, I'm hearing from you. I've definitely developed a, uh, for better or worse, a curriculum. So it's a, it's a series of books I have my mentees read. One of the things that every mentee is asking me, and it's a very generic term in our world today, is I've been told I need more executive presence. What does that mean? And executive presence is one of those things where it's, it means everything and it means nothing. And so you know, I've tried with my mentees, and, and maybe we cover this on another podcast, of what is executive presence in my mind, and, and how do you teach that to other people? And it's not just presentation skills, because you know, executive presence is way more than being a good presenter. And so we spend a lot of time self-evaluating in seven key areas around you know, what I think makes up executive presence. We, we measure that at the beginning of our time, and at the end of our time, to see if they've grown at all. Because hopefully at the end, they, they self-assess themselves as grown in those areas. Uh, you know, series of books, we go through a series of tests and assessments we do around emotional intelligence, around uh, conflict styles, how to manage conflict better. And then a series of just conversations and, you know, that they bring to me of, of challenges they have, you know, they're in the moment that we talk through. And so it's, it's really been, it's awesome. And I, it's become one of the things I love the most about my job is being able to mentor. It really is inspiring. And I, I think, by the way, I'd love to get those books. I'd love to hear some yeah, we'll of your book recommendations that we can even include them in, in the show notes. And I have to say, well, we had, we had Neil Hoyne, who is Google's chief men, measurement officer, I almost said mentorship. We had him on the show and I think he may be more measurement oriented than Neil was. So we'll, uh, well, <laughs> if Neil's <laughs> listening, uh, you, he's on notice. <laughs> oh, thanks. So, uh, Will, just to kind of wrap wrap a little bit, um, you know, we feel like right now. I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier there's a there's a, there's a lot going on in, in in automobile. There's a lot going on in in finance and in a lot of categories. We feel on the, on this um, you know in this sort of digital epoch, if you will, we're, it feels like we're sort of in between business areas or movements. And so we're asking our guests uh, that this summer what what is next. And so what's what is next from your perspective, your lens on GM Financial, and then for you personally, what's what what's happening next, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll wrap it up. I think for the industry, you know, auto finance, automotive in general, uh, still a lot of changes happening. You know, the way customers shop is changing, the way customers drive is changing. You know, I mean, the customers. I, I mean, I have two electric vehicles and one and one gas powered vehicle in our home, and. You know, with the gas prices like they are now, you know, driving electric vehicles is is all the rage, and it's very fun. Honestly, you know, not to go to the gas station mm -hmm. is fun. Yeah. Uh, to just throw it in the throw yeah. it in the garage Keep and going. charge it is yeah. it's it's a blast, right? And so, you know, that that's going to change the business that we're in from just vehicles to a whole series of things that customers think about when it comes to their home and their lifestyle. So. 
you know, you're going to need a charger in your garage or in your apartment or you know where you live, which is which is one thing. But then the question is, okay, well, uh, I've got one vehicle, I've got two vehicles that are electric powered. Well, now I'd like to have a maybe a battery backup that you know powers my home in the case of a you know power loss. I want to add solar to my house so I can get off the grid in some ways. You know, I have excess like right now in Texas. You know, we have a we have super record high temperatures. And there's a ask for reduction of uh, citizens to you know reduce the amount of power they're using. In a perfect world, solar on your house you could sell back to the to the state for for power usage. And so, all of those things have financial impacts to consumers, whether it's buying or selling power, you know, buying or or, or leasing or renting features on your vehicle that allow some of these things to happen. Uh, the next generation of our vehicles are going to have downloadable software and features that you can pay for. So. You want to add a feature in your car that, you know, it'll come with that out of the box, but you can upgrade to it, you know, the software version of it. And so it just opens up a lot of opportunities for the finance company to be involved in a lot of these transactions. I mean, ownership itself is changing. I just saw here in, in Texas that, you know, if, if you want to buy a home, but can't afford the down payment, you can actually have someone buy it for you and do like a lease to own through this, this third party. And so ownership of houses, cars, you know, everything is is on the verge of a, a tipping point and changing. And so the part that we get to play at GM Financial is exciting because, you know, it's it's kind of the the intersection of the product, uh, the payment, you know, the affordability of that product, um, how you pay for those things and and kind of the central hub for billing. And then, you know, just the electrification of our, our whole industry is is gonna it's gonna upend a lot of what we do today. Yeah. Great. Will, anything else you wanted to share with us about what's next? Yeah, I would share a little bit about, and, and this kind of goes to, to mentorship as well, but just career growth in general. I had a mentor, in fact, this morning tell me this, and it really, I had to say it a couple of times. It made me think a lot. It, it said, uh, you will not become what you are already not becoming. And I, you know, I have so many folks that are asking me for advice or, you know, hey, I want to do this or I want to do that in my career. And I had to read it again to myself. You, know, you will not become what you are already not becoming. And this idea that I, I want to do this or that in my career, but I'm not working on it now is, is kind of a, a crazy mentality, right? I mean, yeah, I I've know when I, was, yeah. when I was younger, I used to say at some point I'll live by a budget when I, ha- when I make more money. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the ridiculousness of that statement of when I make more money, I'll live by a budget. But for now, I don't have to is, is, is immature and, and <laughs> silly. And so it's that same mentality career wise that, you know, I want to do something different and change, but I, I'm not doing the things I need to do to prepare for it. Right. A lot of what we talk about at GM Financial and, and, and Mary talks about General Motors is, you know, the c- career growth nowadays is, is no longer a ladder, it's a lattice. And it's, it's up, it's to the side, it's, it's scooting down, it's, it's in diagonal moves. And, you know, I've encouraged my employees to really think about that. You know, f- growth for us looks like, you know, switching, switching teams or, or cross training and from different groups. And so I've been a big advocate for that, uh, for my team for a long time. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of, of my employees shift and grow through that, which has been very exciting. With that said, I'm, I'm following in the footsteps I'm giving the following the advice I'm giving to my employees in that, um, my own career, I would say that you know, I'm looking for new experiences in my career as well and new challenges and adventures. And so about, oh, about two months ago, I was contacted by, by one of my leaders, Deborah Wall, our CMO at, at GM. And she asked, hey, would you consider, um, you know, some changes in your career here at General Motors? And I said, yeah, I'm open to talking about it. And so lo and behold, the, the change for me was, you know, the request and, and the acceptance of, of this last week of running Chevrolet. And so the, the opportunity to run Chevrolet, both for design, marketing, sales, and after sales in, in Shanghai, China. And so, uh, you know, in the next few months, I'll be transitioning from my role here as chief digital and marketing officer at GM Financial uh, over to Shanghai, China to, to be a general manager of the Chevrolet business in China. Congratulations, Will. That is that's that that's a few changes. That's a few that's a few moves on the lattice. It is. <laughs> that's like a three D lattice. I'm gonna have to tell you, Will. That's uh, we're gonna have to come up with that. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. It's a big change, and but but one right. that 
you know, I think will push me in ways that I haven't been pushed before, you know, to, to be responsible for a brand. In China, we have 405 Chevy dealers. So to be responsible for sales with those dealers and, and really help build the, the brand of Chevrolet in a, in a global format, in a, in a culture and language that I don't understand quite yet. So it's going to be a, a wonderful challenge, uh, you know, really honored to be able to have the ability to, to pivot like this for my career you know, and, and try something new. And the, the trust that the leadership has put into me uh, for this is a, a real honor and, and very excited about it. That's great, Will. And um, what a, yeah, what amazing learning opportunity. And I love this concept, this lattice concept. I really do. It's really, it's really hit me. But you're, you know, you've had so much success personally, and you've built these systems, and you've built the brand at, at GM Financial. It's a great risk to take. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. <laughs> um, right, but yeah. uh, kind of, I was thinking back to some other companies I've, I've been with where we, we, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of mobility, and I've sort of. I've sort of forgotten about that, you know, and the idea, I remember doing rotations where I worked for Whirlpool, you know, and I was, uh, I was in a plant and then you're in HQ and you're in quality, then you're in design. So it's, it's great to see that, that concept still kind of working out in an era where it feels like we focus so much on specialization. So uh, love to hear the opportunity and, and see what's going to happen next for you. Well, yeah, thanks. I think to your point on specialization, I think it's a chance for me to in some ways to unspecialize and to be a little more broad. And then at the same time, you know, China is a, is a country and a culture that is digitally advanced than where we are in the States. And so I'm excited to learn about how, how the Chinese population, how the technology centers, Shanghai is, is one of the technology epicenters of, of China and of the world in some ways. And so to learn how they operate, you know, financially, um, how they own and drive vehicles, how they shop for vehicles. You know, ch- there's there's 40 to 50 manufacturers of vehicles in China, way more than there are in the states. So the competition is is intense, and electrification is much more advanced in China as well. And so, some good headwinds for us, some challenges, but ones that I'm excited to face. Well, uh, download the WeChat app now. If you haven't done <laughs> yeah, it already. Have, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> I've started the WeChat and I've started uh, my Mandarin lessons. So uh, yeah. learning, wow. learning each day. That's awesome. Well, well, well I, I'm looking forward to catching up with you at least a, another couple of times because um, you know, I'd love to hear a more around the executive presence. That's probably a whole other episode. And I'd love to catch up with you, you know, as you kind of get yourself settled uh, in Shanghai. So wonderful. Thanks for the time for this episode. It's, it's, it's revealing some really fresh advice that you've really accumulated over the years. And, uh, we're always great to catch up with you. Will. thanks so much, Jim. Thanks for having me. Take care. Now it's time for our namesake segment. What if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Hey, Kim. Hey, Jim. Kim Will gave us a lot to think about today from auto sales and financing, leadership, intuition, mentorship, and a big career announcement. What were the big takeaways? Yeah, quite a big career announcement. Pretty exciting. Yeah. You know, we work with a lot of automotive OEMs, and, and I'm always surprised when we talk with people like Will that automotive continues to change and respond to buyer trends and really, I think, keep up with customer expectations in their own unique way. And, you know, the automotive industry is responding to some serious market forces right now. So it's really interesting to hear Will talk about how they're responding. EV, we know, is likely to drive new customer demands, more in-home outfitting, more network support, more visibility to incentives and rebates, you know, so it's not just the actual car anymore. But I thought what was really the most powerful takeaway was Will's discussion around mentorship, mentorship as a framework for career growth, mentorship at any stage in the career for specific reasons, and his comment that really any leadership, um, including digital leadership, of course, is, is a combination of art and science. And I know in our episodes, we tend to focus very much on digital, but uh, leadership is such a big mm-hmm. part of it. So it was really a nice, refreshing part of the conversation for me. I love to hear those experiences and those insights. And, you know, he started talking about metrics and KPIs and, I, and we love that stuff. And I know we are yes. a little nerdy about it, right? But he yes. talks about days on the <laughs> lots and there's a lot of great little KPIs and you kind of imagine this dashboard. But what I loved about this episode is he did a great job of tying it together with the 
<laughs> decidedly non-digital. You know, and we talk about empathy a lot, right? But he talked about what I call a couple leadership dilemmas, which I, I think are fun problems to solve. But what I liked is his leadership in recognizing these dilemmas, because honestly, I think we see, unfortunately, some some leadership who do not see these dilemmas. Right. You know, mm-hmm. They just sort of jump and react. You know, and I wanted to bring up the one I call the, the DRIP problems, kind of an old, bring back another old acronym, data rich, information poor. You know, he talked a lot about having more data than ever and uh, this sort of dilemma of choosing and deciding which which ones he's going to respond to. Right. You know, and, and he's getting pressure from his customers, from his leadership, from, you know, his stakeholders on getting the really cool new stuff, but he's got to still keep the lights on. So I, I, I love those kinds of dilemmas, you know, when you, in the, in the face of, you know, an infinite number of ideas and, and pressure, how do you, how do you make the right ones? And, and data is just, uh, just part of it. So Kim, you know, what's the what if coming out of that in your mind? Well, I think the big what if is like you mentioned, how do you be an empathetic leader and use data to make decisions that really you feel good about in your gut? So my big what if is what if you could be a seasoned leader at the beginning of your digital career by leaning more into intuition? So letting intuition really guide your interpretation of that data. You're right. When these episodes, I, I love data. I love quantitative information, but qualitative is, is so much more important sometimes than quantitative. And I like Will's approach to using intuition to balance those two inputs. So that's my what if. What's the so what? Let me understand this, Kim. If I had all the data in the world, that's not enough, right? Right. <laughs> so it's true. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you know it. It really is, and again, I think I love this tie. This is like a whole other thread around around empathy, and I think we do a much better job of of thinking about tying it together to judgment, to instinct, and gut feel. And again, data is really what's driven a lot of the transformation. You know, you have we're generating more data, but you are also processing more data. Not new, but if you right. look back at you know tracking shipments and finding patterns, you know in Global pandemics or 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 forensic behavior, um, getting same day shipping. Those are all big data problems. Right. You know, they're really they're really a catalyst. That's great, super cool. But can you pull it all together? And if everyone had the same data, the same look, the same facts in front of them, what's going to make the difference? You know, I think you need intuition. You need experience. And I think you're you're right, Kim. That is going to be the difference maker. The so what is I think again imagine the scenario, all things being equal, if you can tap into that intuition, if you can get a head start uh, on that intuition and that judgment, you're going to make the better decision sooner. There's a phrase I love. Uh, it's it's a tongue in cheek one. Good judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment. Right. You know. So so how do you how do you get that? without all the mistakes. So so what can we do about it, Kim? When, now what? Yeah, right. Well, I think the corollary to that, when we talk about digital and customer experience, we talk a lot about the experience is the brand. So you can use data all day to drive transactions, but is that a good experience for the customer? Well, how are you going to arrive at that good experience if you don't have empathy? That's and a I great think point. at the yeah, at the root of empathy uh, really is emotional intelligence. And I've spent a fair amount of my career studying this topic. And while this topic and supporting research has grown in popularity over the years, it's still, I think, an overlooked component of professional development that any individual at any stage of their career can work to improve on. And this is really true. I've, I've gotten pushback to say, well, you know, emotional intelligence is equivalent to your personality and it can't be changed. Not the case. It's really mm. not the case. And mentorship, I think, to Will's point, is really a great avenue to help develop emotional intelligence. But it's always good to get a baseline to see what aspects of your emotional intelligence you can improve upon to help you feel more confident in using empathy to drive decision making, to feel more confident in that gut and that empathy. So my now what is is really easy, I think, to get started, pick a type of an, an assessment for emotional intelligence. There's trait based, there's competency, there's behavioral. And we'll include some links in the show notes so you can kind of see, you know, the different types and make a decision on what you want to try out. 
but take one of them, see where you're at. Chances are you'll get some immediate insights on how you might approach interpretation of both qualitative and quantitative data a little differently based on your own EI strengths and weaknesses. And more importantly, I think how you might deliver your interpretation of that qual and quant data to your teams and decide on some next steps in a way that is more accessible really to the people you're trying to communicate with. And that's really all about using empathy uh, to lead and drive change. It's It sounds basic, but I, I really like this mm-hmm. real actionable step. I do too, Kim. And I actually, I really like that you've made emotional intelligence also measurable, by the way. So I can I can I evaluate. <laughs> there's it's an inevitable. assessment for everything. Yes, there's an assessment. It's a score. You know, I, I there's I have an right. I have a, I have an EQ score waiting for me this weekend. Excellent. Um, no, that's great. I mean, I think I love your. Yeah, actually, it's inspirational that the difference between personality and EQ. I think that's um, that's great to hear. Uh, again, we don't hear it enough, and um, and there's always there's always room for improvement. So, thanks, Kim, for that. Very actionable. Now, what gave us a lot to do. <laughs> uh, again, something something I'm going to set aside this weekend. And thanks so much to Will Stacy for sharing really so much about his personal journey and giving us a lot to think about and do. We'll be sure to add a few of those resources to the show notes. And I'm looking forward to catching up with him again. And thanks to you for listening. We hope you heard something you can use today. When you listen again, we hope your EQ score is a little higher. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and when it is, you will rate and subscribe us. Uh, please do so. <laughs> rate, rate and subscribe us on your favorite platform. And until next time, keep asking what if, so what, most importantly, now what? You've been listening to What If, So What, the digital strategy podcast from Proficient with Jim Hertzfeld and Kim Chopek. We want to thank our Proficient colleague, J.D. Norman, for our music today. Subscribe to the podcast and don't miss a single episode. You can find this season along with show notes at Proficient.com. Thanks for listening.